there is a ton going on in the card world, especially the basketball card world right now. So I thought it was a good time to do a quick little Q and A. So let's jump right into that. Welcome to the most passionate content for card collectors on YouTube and possibly the whole entire internet. As usual, I am your host, Jake Roy, 90s b-ball cards here on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, a little bit TikTok. It is coming back soon. <laughs> I can tell you that the, the guy I was working with is uh, creating a bunch of stuff that I'll be putting out there very soon. So uh, stay on the lookout there more to come. So uh, like I said, today we are going to do a Q&A. I said a little quick one. I uh, don't know how uh, quick it might actually be in terms of duration. Uh, we'll get into that more. But uh, yeah, it was quick in terms of the preparations for it. So with that in mind, we've got some questions that I got mostly off of Instagram, again, because the preparations were pretty quick. So we're going to buzz through those uh, and, and, you know, a really good, uh, I think, broad range of questions for the most part here. So uh, like, you know, I like to do Q and A's. I usually prep them a couple weeks in advance. So that way everybody on all the different platforms can get questions in. But this is going to be a little bit of a quicker one. Uh, so stay on the lookout on Instagram. That's uh, where I'm, you know, most frequently posting there and YouTube. So uh, we're going to jump right into the questions. Without any further ado, the first one we have here uh, is who do you have in the finals? I, I abbreviated a little bit. So uh, for the West, I'm going to stick with my preseason pick. You might have heard me on some other podcasts and stuff talking about this in the past, but my preseason pick is the same then as it is now. It's going to be the Golden State Warriors. Uh, for the Eastern Conference, I'm going to go with the Miami Heat. Uh, at this point, and when you're watching this, we might already know what the end of this series uh, for both the conference finals look like. But at this point, it seems like it's kind of going back and forth between the Celtics and the Heat. I think it's probably going to be a seven-game series, but I think the Heat uh, have a, a little bit more depth right now than the Celtics. But the Celtics are playing very well. I could see either team absolutely putting up a great fight in the finals. And... Uh, you know, regardless of whichever team comes out of the West, I'm going to pick the Warriors. Again, that was my preseason pick, so, um, you know, hopefully hopefully what I said at the beginning of the year ends up being true. It's always nice when that happens, uh, but not always common. Next question here from uh, Alex Jardin. Uh, we've got, uh, what are your thoughts on crossover grading? So he's really talking about uh, crossing over, whether it's from like a BGS 9.5, hoping for a PSA 10, uh, or, you know, an SGC 9, hoping maybe it's going to be a 9 uh, with PSA and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, my thoughts there are, it's really case by case. It's not something I do a lot. You have probably seen in uh, some of my most recent grading uh, stuff that I'm not afraid to crack things out but a lot of times it's either something because I see a flaw that can be fixed by just using a microfiber cloth and wiping it down uh, and maybe that'll help the grade improve or something that's been mislabeled uh, you might have seen that with my my black label Jordan we talked about that so you know stuff like that is when I like to cross things out and then I might get a little bit risky and uh, rather than just putting it in and trying to get a, a new slab, uh, you know, I might try to roll the dice and, and see how it comes out. But I'm very analytical when it comes to sending anything in for grading, trying to do kind of like a CBA of my own and make sure that it's going to be a good use of my hobby funds, because uh, I don't want to deplete my funds and just send a whole bunch of things into grading that don't really make sense. So uh, try to be pretty analytical there. Um, for my own personal collection, I prefer things in uh, BGS slabs sometimes. I don't like the thick PSA slabs. Sometimes I like the look, uh, but I don't like things that are 8.5 or below. So if I have something that's in a BGS 8, I might send that into SGC or PSA just because I like the look of those slabs better. So, you know, sometimes I'll send things into different companies if it's just an aesthetic thing. Uh, but usually at this point, I'm holding on to those until grading prices come down a bit more. Uh, you know, so again, I'm not afraid to cross things over, but uh, typically if I'm getting stuff in my collection, it's not like it's going to be something to flip in which case I would probably be sending stuff into PSA those tend to get the biggest bang for your buck um, but if it's a PC item you know anything between PSA BGS and SGC I'm fine leaving those in those slabs right now um, and uh, you know that's that's kind of my thoughts there but I'm not afraid to do it uh, if the if the situation uh, calls for it but case by case for sure uh, next one here so this is an interesting one uh, so Doc Collects Cards asks 
Uh, what's your preference? A PSA with a population of 10 and only 20 higher or getting a, a PSA 10 with a population of 500? So, you know, lower grade, lower pop, more rare or scarce, uh, presumably, or a higher grade, higher pop, more common. Uh, so in this is one that definitely depends, and I can come up with a lot of different scenarios and situations for either situation. Uh, you know, I, as you know, a lot of times in my collection, I prefer a card to be raw, unless it's something that I really want to have authentication, uh, you know, confirmed on. So uh, in that case, if I'm just making sure that it's authentic, I don't really mind it being a PSA 8 or like I said before, BGS 8.5 and so on and so forth. I mean, I even have some SGC 5s in my collection. So if that's what I'm looking for uh, as far as getting it slabbed, it doesn't really make a big difference. And sometimes, like we've talked about before, I've, I've done some Instagram posts on this. Sometimes a card that is a low pop card might not actually be rare or scarce. Uh, you know, so like there are some cards in my collection that I have that are very low pop and it's not necessarily indicative of the scarcity of that card it's just because it's a card that doesn't get sent in a lot or maybe it's a card for that player that doesn't get sent in a lot so sometimes like i've got a card in my collection that is a pop three none higher it's relatively rare but it's not as rare as other things that have higher populations so uh you know that's where it really pays to to dig into the details do the research and figure out exactly how scarce the card is outside of the population reports because sometimes population reports don't show the whole picture actually almost all the time the population report it doesn't show the whole picture um but at the same time i have cards in my collection uh the jordan intense is one that comes to mind that is uh psa 10 and you know depending on your you know <laughs> where you think uh something as a high pop counts uh you know that one isn't the lowest population uh but it is a condition sensitive set and i think a psa 10 for a condition sensitive set definitely is something that holds a premium to me and a lot of other collectors so you know condition sensitive sets that might be a little bit more common that that uh high grade is going to hold more weight whereas something that might be a little bit more rare and you just want that authentication that lower grade is perfectly fine you know th you think about pmgs uh you know psa six seven or eight is a good grade in a lot of cases for those cards so uh you're really case by case my personal preference like i said kind of rephrasing a little bit is if i want something authenticated i'm not as worried about the technical grade uh i want it to be authenticated and it's usually because it's pretty rare uh and want to make sure it's not you know any funny business going on there so hopefully that answers the question but you know a little bit convoluted Next one we have here, uh, did you have a uh, favorite 90s insert set that you had to complete? Uh, so there are two sets that I have debated uh, chasing down. I haven't really made a ton of headway on either one. So uh, the number one on that list is the 97 SPX Hollow View Heroes. Uh, I've talked about that 97 SPX set. Love the design on those. Love the Hollow View Heroes because while everything else, the base set and the other inserts are all on the horizontal plane, the Hollow View Heroes is the only one that is on the vertical plane. Love the look of that. Love how they incorporated the die cut and the hologram and all the pictures and so on and so forth. I think I talked about this in the last Q&A and probably the one before that and probably more to come as well. So uh, that's a set that I've targeted collecting uh, at some point. You know, I've got a few of the cards. I've got the Jordan. I've got the Penny. Uh, I've got the KG and a few other guys as well. So, um, you know, got the big ones out of the way and I'll get the rest as time comes on. Uh, the other set that I've debated uh, collecting is the Net Assets from 9697 EX2000. Uh, just a gorgeous die cut, laser cut set. Uh, but there is one player on that chat checklist that I really don't like. I don't like getting his cards. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why I might not actually try to collect that set. You know, we'll see, but I don't have some of the bigger name players there. That's another determining factor there. So I've got, you know, the Iverson and the Penny, and I've got, you know, some of the other guys like Patrick Ewing and, and Chris Weber and, you know, a few other guys that are on the checklist there. But, um, I don't have the Jordan and, uh, you know, that's not a top priority. So I definitely say the hollow view heroes from 97 SPX is probably the, the one set that I is highest on my list to try to complete at some point in the future. No, uh, no rush there. Uh, next one here from Buck and Tear, uh, favorite non numbered nineties insert set parallel uh, or, or insert and parallel, I think. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, for parallels, uh, this is kind of a cheat, but uh, I'm going to have to go with refractors. You know, everybody loves a good refractor, but I'm going to give you a bonus because that was kind of an easy low hanging fruit type of question uh, or answer, I should say, on my behalf. Uh, and the other one that I would say is 99 2000 UD Holographics 
awesome au uh for the awesome there so that is a gorgeous set the base set is gorgeous but then adding the gold uh pattern or gold effect there uh is a beautiful beautiful uh parallel so really enjoy those i really enjoy the holographic set um you know and the awesome parallel carries through all their inserts with the exception of the shoe time uh shoe memorabilia card so uh really cool stuff there you know there's a lot of other ones you know 95 96 flare ultra gold medallion are really cool. Uh, 94, 95 collector's choice gold signatures are great unnumbered parallels. So lots of great 90s in parallels, but refractors are definitely going to be top of the list for unnumbered for me. Um, in terms of insert sets, the one that we just talked about, uh, the 97 SPX Hall of View Heroes is probably going to be my number one set and just purely for the design aspects of that card. So i uh, not going to talk too much because uh don't want to get too repetitive here but that's um you know sometimes it changes but that one's always in the top two or three for my list uh probably top one or two uh <laughs> on my list honestly and uh yeah right now it's definitely number one next one here from cardboard insights we have in addition to pc and several players uh are there any other small projects that you work on so uh i wouldn't say any of the projects that i work on are small i definitely uh tend to bite off more than i can chew sometimes or that i'm going to chew on for a very long time so yeah i mean you hit the nail on the head i have a number of pcs uh that i work on you know obviously penny is the top of my pyramid uh you know i'll share the pyramid that i that i worked on a while back on my instagram post but you know you've got penny you've got iverson cage then you've also got Vince Carter, Michael Finley, Lamar Odom, Baron Davis. Then I also get into some of the magic players that, uh, you know, might be in insert sets that Penny's not in uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, lots of players to collect. But uh, yeah, outside of that, we talked about some of the insert sets. So really looking back at that Hall of View Heroes. But the other one that is really another piece of the pyramid uh, that, can't, that I can't forget is I want to get one example of every single insert set and parallel in the 90s. So if Penny in the insert set uh, I want the penny if he's not then Iverson KG so it goes through the pyramid but then if none of my PC players then I'm just gonna get another guy that's in that insert set and there are definitely plenty of insert sets that don't have any of those guys you know so that's when uh, it's nice to get the Jordan sometimes if you can get the Jordan but there's plenty of other guys that are interesting you know getting a guy like David Robinson or Sean Kemp or other guys that I enjoyed in the 90s uh, are always good ideas for my collection to to meet that you know it's really a Mount Everest type of a, a goal that'll keep me collecting and keep me entertained for a very very long time so um not a small project by any means <laughs> All right, so the next one here from Brendan Ryan 74, uh, you know, really the overarching question is really about how you can get some of the FLIR 23 karat gold cards uh, in, in some different questions and formats on that. So uh, there are a lot of different 23 karat gold cards that are out there, a lot of different avenues that they came through, some of them through QVC or HSN, uh, some of them were redemptions, as you mentioned in the question. Uh, but so the other thing is the Golden Idols FLIR set. So that was a set that you could actually get that kind of came in almost a, a compact disc type of uh, cassette uh, packaging uh, but that is something that I've debated trying to get uh, my hands on a box of to open on the channel or, or not you know we'll see we'll see if I can find some they're getting harder to find now uh, and it, it's kind of a question of whether it's uh, worth it to try to track down but maybe it'll happen but yeah so you can get those and there are a lot of cards in there that were basically taking the rookie card of some of the key players uh in the league at that point in time and making it gold so there's a penny version um that you could get you know again those are those are pack pulled cards that were made by the FLIR company kind of uh reprint but you know a different take on the rookie cards uh not something I get too crazy about you know there were some other kind of uh gold foil cards that were made by some other uh you know Know, some of the collegiate companies made some stuff so there's a lot of those that kind of floated around in the 90s it's it's kind of a weird niche area uh of 90s collecting that uh i think some collectors really enjoy and other collectors myself included uh, don't hone in too much on those um so lots of different answers there uh there's not like one standard answer but i would say that that golden idol set is probably where most of them are coming from all right uh next question here thoughts on sean kemp so uh pretty uh we can go a lot of ways with this but uh i really enjoyed sean kemp in the 90s loved watching him with the sonics uh you know it's also fun to have cards from the sonics you know kind of a vestige of the past uh so 
you know, I enjoy looking at the uniforms and, and kind of thinking about what could have been for those teams. And also thinking about, you know, how that team would have been with uh, having KD and Westbrook and Harden as they were with the Thunder. They would have been with the, with the Sonics. So, so fun stuff there uh, from the team perspective. Sean Kemp was, again, a fantastic player to watch. Lots of great highlights. Uh, and also enjoyed watching the highlights and stuff after the fact with him playing against the Bulls in the finals. So uh, I enjoy his cards with the Sonics. After he moved past the Sonics, though, I didn't really care for him uh, too much. You know, he really, at that point, started to take a nosedive after his first year with the Cavs when they had the uh, the lockout season. Um, you know, his, his career didn't didn't go so well. So, uh, you know, those cards that I get sometimes where he's on the Cavs or uh, with the Blazers or, or, heaven forbid, he's, uh, you know, with the Magic, which was a very short-lived experiment. Um, those ones don't bring back fun and fond memories, but also I think that he his cards are more photogenic, uh, if you will, when he was with the Sonics. So uh, enjoy a good Sonics card, and you know, sometimes you know, with that Mount Everest of collecting, if there is a card of Kemp uh, that there's not one of my PC guys, uh, I'm not afraid to get one of those. I, I enjoy those quite a bit. All right, Mostly 90s Basketball Cards asks a great question here. Uh, describe your dream card card room at home. Uh, so this one really got me thinking, and uh, I don't think I have a defined answer. So whenever my wife and I are looking at, you know, future homes and whatnot, uh, it is something that I look at when we look at pictures. Uh, and it is something that we both know that, you know, there will be a room that I will have, uh, you know, probably a little bit more built out than what we have here. But uh, some of the stuff that I definitely want are built-in shelves. Um, you know, I like having some of the stuff that, uh, you know, bring back good memories and are fun to look at behind me here on some built-in shelves. But I also want uh, some more substantial shelving that I can store my collection on. Uh, I like built-ins. It's just kind of one of those things. Uh, you know, so kind of like a home office, but, you know, I could make do... <laughs> with a lot less than a home office uh, and a lot less than a spare bedroom. I can, you know, really make do with a, a corner in the basement somewhere and, and build that out. So uh, definitely want some defined space with some built-in wall shelving. Uh, and uh, that way I can get all the cardboard boxes and I can have them all organized there nicely and, and grab them as they go. So, um, you know, in an ideal world, it would be a, a whole built out home office with, you know, a uh, nice fireplace that I can sit there and, uh, you know, pretend that I, I am, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the Gilded Age, but, um, you know, we'll see. We'll see what that future house holds. And uh, I have had a lot of questions to have uh, to give a tour of how I store my cards. Uh, so that's something that I'm actually working on building out in my current space right now. Uh, so once that's done, I'll, I'll definitely share that. But once we get a new house at some point in the future, you know, we're, we're a ways away from doing that, but uh, it is in our future plans, uh, then I'll definitely share that when that comes as well. So lots of fun stuff to come. Uh, thank you for the question because that really really got my head spinning uh, trying to think of, of what I would want and what that uh, dream scenario would look like. And I'm not sure exactly what the uh, best case scenario would be, but you know, those are, those are some of the thoughts that came to mind. All right, so uh, we got two questions in one, so we'll, we'll take them one at a time here. So, so Dippity Dog NBA cards, I think I think I said that right. Uh, first question, uh, how do you feel, uh, do you feel like, I should say, uh, we'll get the Tim Duncan autos that Panini had flirted with uh, now that they're getting pushed out of basketball? So a uh, little bit of a disclosure, I'm not exactly sure where that ended up landing, if they ended up getting an agreement with Tim Duncan or not. If they did, I would assume either he signed some of those stickers and sent them back, or if he hasn't, uh, there's probably some stipulation in the contract with how many, you know, how long and all that kind of stuff. So if they have existing stickers, uh, autographs or whatnot, I would assume that some of those would start getting packed out at some point in the future. Uh, some people have talked about how Panini with basketball cards, a little bit of a lame duck there. So, um, you know, I don't think that they have a terribly vested interest in getting that stuff out. And in a lot of cases, people have speculated that even after they lose the NBA licensing, uh, they may still produce product that's unlicensed like they have done in the past with baseball. So, um, you know, I don't think that they're in a rush to get any of that stuff out. That's just what we've been seeing. They are taking their sweet time with putting all this stuff out so um you know i think that we'll probably see them if it was something that was penned and they they made an agreement uh, at some point but 
no expectation as to when or what product or how rare they'll be or how quickly they'll come out or anything like that. I don't, I don't think Panini is going to do a whole push of getting all the stuff out the door like we saw in the latter years from Upper Deck and, and others like that. So second part of the question here, um, you know, a little bit of a longer uh, multi-part question still, but so if you had a penny uh, for years, uh, but it has some dings and, you know, not in great condition, paraphrasing here, um, are you good with having it just because it's rare? If another copy were to come out with a price that you're comfortable with, would you stick with the one that you have that's not in great condition and save the money, you know, essentially and use it for another card or would you go for the cleaner copy? So, uh, you know, I have plenty of examples of cards that have gotten dinged up in my collection over the years. Most of those are base cards, stuff that I had when I was a kid. And in those cases, you know, it's a card that's a dollar or less I'll go and get another copy and I'll keep both you know kind of something to remember how I didn't take care of my cards I should and then something that's in better condition that doesn't uh, present so many eyesores um, I don't really have many examples in my collection that are in bad condition uh, there have been some that I've gotten kind of in recent years that maybe had some undisclosed damage or whatnot uh, and if I can't agree to uh, you know something with a dealer like there was one time that uh, I can't remember the exact card but uh, there there was some dis undisclosed damage. The the uh, seller gave me a refund and told me to keep the card, which was a very nice gesture, but I still went and looked for another copy of the card because it bothered me, uh, the condition that it was in. So, you know, there's, there's those situations, um, you know, but in general, if it's something that the condition is such that it takes away from the overall appeal of the card, I will want to go and get a better looking copy. If it's not taking away from the overall uh, condition, you know, the, or the look of the card, the eye appeal of the card, it's uh, something that's not going to bother me, then I will definitely use those funds to go and get a different card in my collection. So it really depends case by case. Uh, but again, if a card comes up for the price that I'm comfortable with, I don't have problems getting duplicates at times when it makes sense in my collection. There's plenty of cards that I have multiple copies of. Uh, and sometimes it's it's helpful too because then other collectors who uh, might not have had an opportunity to get that card, then I can you know help them get their goals as well. So uh, sometimes it can be mutually beneficial to pick up cards when they're at a price that I'm fine with. You know if I'm at a show or something. So. Um, yeah, it really depends on the card and how, how damaged it is uh, and, and how expensive it may be. All right, uh, and so the last question we're going to hit today from late 90s b-ball, uh, a little bit of a multi-part question here as well. So first piece of it, uh, what percent of late 90s cards do you estimate uh, have been lost or you know lost in the trash or whatever uh, and are now forever lost? So uh, you know, really hard to guess. Uh, I know that you were kind of uh, speculating with some PMGs and stuff like that, so um, you know, I would assume that there are some, but I think it also depends somewhat with the product that it was in. You know, products that were, you know, kind of higher end, more geared towards serious collectors, I think we're probably going to see, you know, a much less, uh, you know, shrinkage, if you will. So, you know, thinking about stuff like Flare Showcase, you know, they even had stickers on there that said for serious collectors only. Uh, UD Retro, stuff like that, I would expect that there are very few, if any of those, that have gotten lost over time uh, when you're looking at some of the, like the legacy cards or uh, some of the century autographs and, and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, some of the insert sets from like, let's say Collector's Choice, we've talked about the Star Attractions Gold and how those were in specially marked retail packs. A lot of those, uh, I would suspect, have probably gotten, you know, badly damaged or again, like you said, lost uh, to the sands of time. Uh, even if they haven't been thrown out, maybe they will never get uncovered. Uh, you know, so stuff like that. I think the product probably plays a little bit more into it because when we were kids, uh, if we got something out of a cheap product and we didn't know what it was a lot, uh, you know, we might not have treated it as well as we should have. Uh, and some of those kids have fallen out of collecting and might not ever get back into collecting. And then it's really, you know, we've got to hope that other family members or people that stumble upon those uh, bring them to market. So, um, you know, trying to put a percentage on it is really, it's just a shot in the dark. So, you know, uh, close my eyes and throw a dart and, you know, whatever it lands on, sure. But, uh, you know, maybe 10, 20% or less. Uh, I wouldn't expect more than 10 or 20%. Uh, of any given insert set, but again, I think it's really case by case, uh, depending on the product and uh, and what that product was looked at uh, at that point in time. 
The other point, uh, if you subsequently find out a card you obtained through a trade or otherwise uh, is not authentic when attempting to grade it uh, in the grading process, how long is too long of a time to have passed to approach a seller? And if you do approach them, what sort of outcome is likely? So a uh, very timely question based on uh, the video that we had just last week. So I don't know if you asked this question after watching that video or not, but if you did, uh, if you didn't, you know, kudos to you for uh, being a little bit of a, of a fortune teller there. So what I would say there is uh, one company's uh, assumption on a card isn't necessarily true for all of them. So if it's something that you really want to have authenticated and you trust other companies, feel free to send a card that may be having questionable authenticity from one company to another one and see if they uh, also feel the same way. If you if you get the same response from two grading companies, I would have to go ahead and say that card probably at that point, it's not worth your time to, to send off to another company. Um, but that's just my opinion there on, on that. So, you know, I've, I've seen plenty of instances where uh, sending it to the same company multiple times, sometimes you get a different result. So uh, it is an opinion at that point in time. Uh, I do know certain companies, if they think that something is inauthentic, unauthentic, I'm not sure which word to use there, um, but they will have multiple people in the grading staff look at it. So it's not just being one person's opinion at the point. They're making sure that multiple people, multiple experts are looking at it and rendering their opinion uh, to see if they confirm it or not. So, uh, you know, if if you're getting something and you think it might be suspicious uh, and one grading company says so, uh, you know, feel free to try another one. But again, you know, it's going to be your decision on how you want to spend your money in the hobby as well. Um, as far as reaching out to who you got it from, whether it was a trade or a purchase, uh, it depends uh, on a lot of different factors. First off, your relationship with that person, you know, how you did it. If you did it through eBay, obviously you're going to follow what the eBay uh, turnaround times are for returns and, and whatnot, uh, which at this point I think is 30 days or 60 days. So you've really, you don't have a lot of time between sending something off for grading, getting it back and, and figuring that out with the seller. Uh, in the past, it was about six months, so you had a lot more wiggle room. And in some cases, I know my brother had a situation where there was a Jordan insert card that came back as uh, questionable authentication, uh, questionable authenticity from BGS, and he reached out to the seller on eBay, even though it was outside of the window, and they gave him a full refund, which is a very kind a gesture of them to do. So if it's something that you work on a more personal level with a person, you have a good relationship or you have open communication with that person, uh, you know, in my opinion, there is really no uh, time limit to that. I know that if I made a trade with somebody and they sent the card out for grading and uh, came back as not being authentic, I would definitely give the person a refund, no questions asked. So uh, that's my stance, and I don't care if it's a year or two years later. Um, you know that would that would be the same. Uh, so you know that's that's my personal feeling. I know a lot of other people that I transact with. That's their feeling as well. They want to make sure that everybody feels good about how a deal is done, uh, and that's the case that happened with uh, the car that came back from PSA. I reached out to the dealer. He said, "Let's make this right," uh, and we came to an agreement there. So. You know, no harm, no foul on that. It's somebody that, again, uh, through that trade deal, we had a lot of communication. We stayed in contact. We were uh, trying to make other deals, you know, and I'm sure that's a conversation that's going to continue in the future as well. So no hard feelings there. They didn't know. They had uh, actually a little bit of background. The card that I got from them in a trade, they had gotten in a lot of five of the same card, uh, and they sent three of them off for grading. All three of those came back uh, graded, I think, uh, nines and nine fives, if I remember correctly, from what they said. Uh, so the last two that they hadn't sent off for grading yet, they uh, they uh, had available, and one of those cards is the one that came back with questionable authenticity. So, um, you know, they were just as surprised as I was, but open to figuring something out that worked out for both of us, which I greatly appreciate. So, um, yeah, I would say if you got a relationship with a person, uh, don't be ashamed to to reach out to them, and hopefully you guys can come to an agreement as far as you know how to make it right for everybody. You know, in some cases it depends on the value of the card as well. Uh, you know, lower value cards, it might be a little bit easier to uh, to undo a deal and larger value cards, it might be a little more difficult. Uh, but yeah, so it really depends on a lot of different factors, but I would not be afraid of reaching out to somebody uh, if you have direct information on how to contact them and ask them to, to make the situation right, especially if there was no harm done by either, you know, you or, you know, 
we're going to assume positive intent from the seller or the, the other side of the trade as well. So, um, yeah, those are the questions we got. I really appreciate everybody that submitted questions. Again, it was a pretty quick turnaround time uh, to do this Q&A today. So, uh, you know, stay on the lookout for more uh, calls for question and answers in the future because I, I like doing those from time to time. And uh, let me know down in the comments if you want to see us do more. I know in the past you have said that that's something that you like. Uh, it's more Q&A. So. I will try to do them as often as I have time to do them. Uh, but if you're new here, please consider subscribing. Hit that bell icon so you don't miss any videos in the future. New videos dropping once, sometimes twice a week. We have looks into my uh, my PC, uh, PSA grading review reveals, uh, collector interviews, and so much more. Thanks. We'll talk later.